ओके गाइस सो नेक्स्ट टॉपिक इज अक्यूट किडनी इंजरी तो जस्ट ट्राई टू अंडरस्टैंड दिस टॉपिक इफ आई से अक्यूट किडनी इंजरी मीन्स दिस इज समथिंग दैट इज रिवर्सिबल सो प्रीवियसली इट वॉज कॉल्ड अक्यूट रीनल फेलियर सो वी हैव डिफरेंट नेम फॉर दिस कंडीशन सो प्रीवियसली आई कैन से दिस वॉज कॉल्ड ए आर एफ ए आर एफ मीन्स एक्यूट रीनल फेलियर बट रिमेंबर इट इज समथिंग दैट इज रिवर्सिबल सो दैट इज वाई वी डोंट यूज द टर्म फेलियर नाउ नाउ वट वी कॉल दिस नाउ वट वी कॉल दिस वी कॉल दिस ए के आई एक्यूट किडनी इंजरी सो समटाइम यू मे सी इन सम एमसी क्यू यू कैन सी एक्यूट इनल फेलियर सो अंडरस्टैंड दैट इज मीन दे आर टॉकिंग अबाउट एक्यूट इनल फेलियर एक्यूट इनल फेलियर एक्यूट किडनी इंजरी सेम थिंग सो इफ आई से हाउ यू विल डिफाइन दिस आई कैन डिफाइन दिस देर विल बी इम्पेयरमेंट ऑफ किडनी फंक्शन तो देर विल बी इम्पेयरमेंट ऑफ किडनी फंक्शन so there will be some impairment in kidney function and this impairment will occur over few days or few weeks over days to weeks right and because of this what you will see you will see there will be retention of uh, toxic substance or nitrogenous waste so there will be leading to retention of nitrogenous waste so this is what we can say this is the definition of aki there will be impairment of kidney function over a few days to few weeks and that is leading to retention of nitrogenous waste so these substances usually they are uh, excreted by kidney but now kidney is having some issues so kidney is having some problems so it is not uh, removing those things out so if i say uh, we have different cause so we can divide if i say causes we can divide under three headings uh, so i can say we can divide causes like it could be a pre renal aki it could be a renal aki or it could be post in like so cause we can divide under three headings so i can say we can divide causes like there could be a pre renal aki pre renal aki means before the kidney whenever uh, there is a kidney damage but uh, it's a non kidney cause i can say any cause before the kidney then it can be renal so we can divide like pre renal aki renal aki and we can say post renal aki so renal aki sometimes we also call this intrinsic aki intrinsic aki means problem is where problem is in the kidney itself so if i say out of these pre renal means before the kidney renal means in the kidney post renal means like a problem in the bladder and the blood bladder outflow tract in the uh, there is fibrosis in the ureter so anywhere outer to this in the pelvic pelvic ureteral junction so i can say if i say the most common cause the most common cause will be pre renal aki most common cause will be pre renal aki and in pre renal aki remember in pre renal aki the most out of this most common is pre renal and in this most common will be your sepsis so generally you will see they can ask in mcq out of these three most common type is pre renal and in pre renal most common cause will be sepsis so if i say uh, what are the renal causes so i can say this renal causes of aki so let me put put this in a box this these are the kidney causes the so renal causes i can further divide so either it could be a problem in the kidney glomerulus so we call this glomerular cause so either it can be due to a glomerular cause or it can be a problem in the vessels so we call this vascular cause so either it could be a problem in the kidney glomerulus or it could be a problem in the kidney vessels or it can be a defect in tubules so understand this in kidney the problem can occur at three places it can occur in glomerulus in the vascular in the vessels in the tubules so if i say vascular glomerular cause means glomerular cause means your glomerulonephritis gn gn means glomerulonephritis if i say vascular cause vascular cause so this can be this can be due to conditions like hemolytic uremic syndrome hus it can be due to a condition called ttp 
thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura and sometime it can be due to atherosclerosis atherosclerosis if i say damage to the tubules damage to the tubules remember the tubule tubular damage can occur because of sepsis so tubular damage can occur because of sepsis then tubular damage can occur because of there is some ischemia to the tubules right so it can be due to some ischemia to the tubules or it can occur due to exposure of some nephrotoxic drug so it can be due to nephrotoxic drugs so in the tubules you can get uh, damage because of this reason so i can say whenever there is ischemia to the tubules whenever there is ischemia to the tubules this will lead to necrosis of the tubule what do we call this we call this atn atn means acute tubular necrosis this ischemia can lead to atn acute tubular necrosis so understand this this is a classification which i told in front of you just remember this we can divide prerenal renal post renal if i say post renal it can be due to bladder outflow obstruction it can be due to pelvic pelvo ureteral obstruction so what is most important remember most common cause will be prerenal i can say renal cause can be glomerular glomerulonephritis it can be vascular like any problem with the vessels like one condition is called hemolytic uremic syndrome so if i say few line about this remember this is hemolytic uremic syndrome it is caused by your e coli that is entero hemorrhagic e coli e h e c if i say which strain o 157 h 7 strain o 157 h 7 strain this will be the strain hemolytic uremic syndrome if i say ttp thrombo thrombocytopenic purpura this occur this occur generally due to mutation called adam ts 13 mutation so in both the diseases we have a common finding like uh, they both can damage a kidney they both can damage your brain right and they both will have maha maha means micro angiopathic and micro angiopathic hemolytic anemia means micro angiopathic hemolytic anemia so both will have maha and in both the cases you will see some common features so just i am writing the common features so both will have kidney manifestation both will have cns manifestation both will have maha micro angiopathic hemolytic anemia and because of maha if you see their kid, their their peripheral smear they will have broken rbcs right uh, you will see this peripheral smear you will see a broken fragment of rbcs what what we call them we call them helmet cells so sometime they ask an hematology question helmet cells are seen in so it can be seen in any condition that is breaking your rbc helmet cells are also called cystocytes cystocytes clear okay so one by one uh, let me tell you in detail about these things so let me say first thing what i am writing in front of you that is pre renal cause pre renal cause So understand prenatal cause. Uh, there are different cause. Most common, I told you, sepsis. So it can be due to sepsis. It can be due to hypovolemia. So whenever patient is having volume loss, so we call this hypovolemia. That can cause. That hypovolemia can also occur after sepsis. Hypovolemia. Then I can say third cause. I can say third cause. It can be due to heart failure. congestive heart failure that can cause aki heart failure after heart failure patient will develop aki if i say in uh, liver we have a syndrome uh, that i discussed in liver section that is called hepato renal syndrome hrs hrs remember there are different types of hrs two common type of hrs are type 1 hrs so we have type 1 hrs and type 2 hrs So type one HRS, remember what I told you, there will be doubling of serum creatinine half of GFR in less than two weeks. So there will be serum creatinine. This will be doubled, and you will see GFR. GFR will be half. So doubling of serum creatinine and half of GFR, and this will occur in less than two weeks. In less than two week period. If I say type two, type two HRS is rather slow. It is a chronic. It is chronic. Slow. over many weeks so this i told do you there and remember this type 2 this type 2 will present with refractory ascites this type 2 will present with refractory ascites refractory ascites means any ascites that is not responding with the maximal dose of your diuretics right like we give we give 
either it is not responding to 160 mg of furosemide and 400 mg of spinolactone is it clear so ascites that is not responding to maximum dose of diuretic plus salt restriction diet that ascites is called as refractory ascites and what is the maximum dose 160 mg of furosemide 400 mg of spinolactone so there can be hepatorenal syndrome then remember prerenal also can occur because of certain drugs it can also occur because of certain drugs am i clear certain drugs if i say <coughs> if i say <coughs> post renal cause if i say post renal cause so remember this post renal cause it can occur because of uh, any problem in bladder outflow obstruction so i am writing this b o u b o u means bladder outflow obstruction or it can be due to pelvic ureteral obstruction so either uh, there is a problem in your bladder outflow or there is a problem in your ureteric outflow so this problems understand this, this problems can be in different form so if i give you examples of these diseases which can cause post renal so it can be due to bph benign prostate hypertrophy or hyperplasia it can be due to bladder fibrosis so there is some structure or fibrosis in the bladder it can be due to ureteric fibrosis it can be due to ureteric fibrosis right it can be due to some blood clot in the bladder or in the ureter so these are a few reason then understand if i say if i say what else is important you should remember you should remember there are there are some uh, miscellaneous cause or some toxin that you should remember so just i am writing here toxins so these are basically your toxins or we call them nephrotoxin so what are these toxins uh, which can lead to aki or acute kidney failure so first starting with the first one that is your any type of iodine containing contrast iodinated contrast right if i say next toxin next toxin that is uh, amino glycoside and antibiotic amino glycoside this can become a toxin in higher doses or on long term use for many cancer we use a drug called cisplatin 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 then i can say normal uh, an anti anti fungal that we use to treat uh, mucormycosis and many other fungal infection we call this amphotericin b amphotericin b nsaid on higher doses and even 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 ppi remember ppi nsaid and ppi they both can damage your tubules ppi proton pump inhibitor right so these are some some of the exogenous causes if i say uh, some more things like uh, what other things can cause uh, i can say some other things or some other uh, some other things that can damage your kidney like i can say suppose a person a person is having uh, a snake bite right so there can be i can say this i am writing this here and venomation and venomation means a person who is having snake bite or i can say spider bite scorpion sting so any type of n venomation due to snake bite scorpion bite or i can say caterpillar bite caterpillar bite right spider bite so this can also lead to aki then remember certain infections like uh, malaria certain infection like malaria leptospira malaria leptospira this can also cause aki suppose uh, there is an earthquake in this building and we all are crushed so our muscles is releasing myoglobin so that is what we call crush injuries in crush injuries you will see myoglobin is being released so there will be rhabdomyolysis so rhabdomyolysis can cause aki if i say if i say uh, hemolysis excess hemolysis can also damage your kidney so like like what we see in hemolytic anemia like we see in hemolytic anemia 
a condition called multiple myeloma multiple myeloma so remember multiple myeloma you will see the protein like a Benz Jones protein so there are different protein in, in later stage you will see amyloid deposition so they can also damage your kidney so remember next is what multiple myeloma can cause damage to kidney crystals so usually stones don't cause AK but remember if a stone is bigger, bigger or the stone is breaking into pieces and that those pieces are not getting out from the kidney. So those crystals, stones can also lead to AK. Stones can also lead to AK. If I say other causes I can say like uh, crush injuries, hemolytic anemia, multiple myeloma, infection, certain infection cause cause and, and one more I can say suppose uh, your blood group is B positive and I am giving you A blood group that is mismatch blood transfusion mismatch BT blood transfusion so these are uh, some of the I can say these are some of the rare causes these are some of the rare causes of AKI these are some of the rare causes okay uh, coming to uh, nephrotoxin like this toxin can be in the form of iodine contrast amino glycosides is platin amphotoxin B NSAIDs PPI then if I say these are the important uh, these are some of the important thing then there are some somewhere less important things which you can remember or if you want otherwise you can skip it out there are certain other drugs like I can say I can say we have drugs like uh, gemcitabin so just this just, just, just I am revising you gemcitabin is a drug of choice for pancreatic cancer then metomycin 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 also we use in many cancer then uh, we have an, a monoclonal antibody bevacizumab Bevacizumab is used in cancer and in treatment of proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Bevacizumab. In uh, Chinese herb, Chinese herb, they use a drug. Uh, that drug is called aristocolic acid. That drug is called aristocolic acid. And this, remember this aristocolic acid, this Chinese herbal medication, this cause a type of nephropathy we call this Balkan nephropathy this MCQs I have seen in BG exams so just I am discussing this Balkan nephropathy Balkan nephropathy then remember ethylene glycol ethylene glycol this can cause damage to your kidney ethylene glycol I can say uh, some other drugs like uh, phoscarnate so some antiviral drug like as phoscarnate, acyclovir, acyclovir, tenofovir. So these are few, even sedofovir also. These are few antiviral which can uh, damage to your kidney, especially your tubules. If I say penicillin, penicillin, cephalosporin, cephalosporin. Fluoroquinolone, fluoroquinolone, sulfonamide, they also can damage the kidney. So sometimes they ask a question, all are damaging your kidney except sulfonamide. Rifampicin, anti-tubercular drug can also damage your kidney. Rifampicin. So these are few causes that you should remember. Uh, then remember, uh, sometimes th that they ask you in MCQ, like how how your PPI and NSAIDs will damage so remember proton pump inhibitor and NSAIDs what they will do uh, they will first cause uh, tubulo interstitial nephritis they will first cause tubulo interstitial nephritis and that will further lead to AKI so first they will damage to your tubules Proton pump any better than NSAIDs. Okay, then I want to add uh, one more thing. Like, suppose uh, you are having a patient who is having burn, right? So, remember what happened in burn patient? In burn, there is hypovolemia. So, I can say in burn patient, or I can say a patient uh, who is suffering from acute pancreatitis, or a person who is having shock. So, it can be any shock. So understand this burn patient, acute pancreatic shock patient, they will develop, they will develop fluid loss. Right? In fact, a DKA patient can also have the same thing. Because of this fluid loss, they will develop AKI. So AKI you can also see in burn patient and acute pancreatitis. 
right now understand this uh, i just want to mention a drug called vancomycin so vancomycin is a drug that we commonly use to treat uh, mrsa so vancomycin can also damage your tubules it can also cause ak so these are some uh, mcqs which i have seen that they keep on asking then understand so we can have AKIs, it can be secondary to some drugs, it can be due to toxins, it can be due to mismatch blood transfusion, then the NMCQ called Balkan nephropathy, they are asking on this drugs. So aminoglycoside is an old favorite question, they can ask you question amphotericin B, then remember this snake bite can also cause AKI, crush injuries question they have asked, mismatch blood transfusion, multiple myeloma, multiple myeloma is important, clear? Okay, now just try to understand this, if I say, uh, what is uh, mainly happening here is, uh, if I say kidney is something that receives 20% of cardiac output, right? So in kidney we have part, like we have cortex, we have medulla. So remember, like outer medulla, outer medulla, this is the part uh, that is at risk, that is I can say more vulnerable to damage. So part that is more vulnerable to ischemia, that is your outer medulla. So which part is most, most vulnerable to damage, that is your outer medulla. Clear? Now what happened? Uh, sometimes they ask you what is the pathogenesis, why sepsis is called AKI. So remember whenever a patient is having sepsis, what happens sepsis? So understand the sepsis you will see, it is like TLC are high, more cytokines are released. So there is, there is cytokine storm increase in level of cytokine more cytokines are released the cytokines what they will do what they will do they will they what they will do they will affect your nitric oxide synthesis right so with no synthase activity is affected so you will you will notice there will be efferent vasodilation there will be efferent vasodilation whenever you will see efferent vasodilation you will notice gfr will reduce gfr will reduce so basically just try to understand this sepsis is causing AKI because of which transmitter that they ask in exam that is because of PG exam question nitric oxide nitric oxide is it clear then uh, all type of contrast okay just uh, I want to focus this all type of contrast can cause nephropathy so we call this contrast induced nephropathy so contrast that we use in CT or we use in MRI or sometimes we use like barium, they all can damage your kidney. So remember, it is mandatory to get a KFT done, KFT or at least urea creatinine, right, uh, and blood urea nitrogen. That is, these two tests are mandatory before going for any contrast based investigation in any patient. So contrast, understand this, it can be contrast MRI. In MRI, what do we use? We use gadolinium. Right, uh, so like in bowel purgative, sometimes we use uh, sodium phosphate solution. So like MRI, I can say CT in uh, bowel preparation or in bowel purgative in uh, barium. I can say barium meal or barium follow through, right? Or I can say barium enema, right? So we can use different forms of barium or barium swallow. So whenever we use contrast, remember this contrast can cause damage to kidney. This contrast will damage kidney. So what we should do, understand this, suppose you are having a patient and you have to do, there is no option, you have to do a radio, you have to do a contrast based test. So what we do is, how we can prevent this, so how it is managed, so understand this, suppose any patient who is having a high serum creatinine or high blood urine nitrogen, in that, that case, first what we do is hydrate the patient. So first thing is try to avoid contrast. In a patient of deranged kidney function, try to avoid contrast. If it is unavoidable, what we should do, hydrate patient by giving plenty of oral fluid, water to drink, give IV fluid bolus. So give uh, one to two liter of IV fluid, IV fluid bolus, and what we can give, we can give injection of mucinac. That is injection of an acetylcysteine. Injection of an acetylcysteine. 
This N acetyl cysteine is the drug that can prevent contrast induced nephropathy. This question came once an exam. So N acetyl cysteine is the same mucolytic drug which, which we use in nebulized form in treatment of cystic fibrosis. And now we have a new drug called Evacaftor. We can use N acetyl cysteine where in as a mucolytic. In patient of bronchiectasis, we can use this to induce sputum when patients they don't have sputum. So we can give injection of N acetyl cysteine and remember it is also the antidote for your paracetamol toxicity. This is about your contrast induced nephropathy. So now understand if I say if I say how a patient will present to you or how you will manage this. So first let me say we have a diagnostic criteria. So previously what we were using that was a rifle criteria. However, this is like rifle criteria, it is based on two parameters. So what are the two parameters of this rifle criteria? First is a lab parameter that is your serum creatinine and second parameter will be a clinical monitor criteria that is your urine output but however this criteria is now replaced by Kidigo so now what we follow we follow Kidigo but sometimes they ask you the full form of rifle it is not the rifle which you carry so understand this this rifle rifle mean meaning there is risk R for risk I for injury so risk injury there will be failure there will be loss and ultimately there will be ESRD so remember this acronym uh, this full form of this rifle but nowadays what we have we have uh, one more a better criteria that is called Kidigo this is important Kidigo that is kidney disease improvement global outcome Kidigo so nowadays what we follow we follow Kidigo so based on Kidigo, what we can say, we can based on this Kidigo, we categorize stages of AKI. So based on Kidigo, what we have, we have different stages of AKI. So understand this. So again, this Kidigo is also based on same parameter. What same parameter? Same. Same parameter means you need to see two parameters, serum creatinine and urine output. So parameters will be same. So Kidigo is based on two parameters. One is your so let me write this uh, serum creatinine and second will be your urine output urine output clear so if I say urine output serum creatinine so based on these two parameters what we can classify we can categorize AKI into three stages so we can have stage 1 we can have stage 2 and there can be stage 3 ok so try to understand this so if I say we can have stage 1, 2, 3 so these are the stages of AKI based on Kidigo kidney disease improvement global outcome so if I say in stage 1 what you see you will see serum creatinine will be increased by so this time putting an arrow like this increased by 1.5 to 1.9 times clear if serum creatinine is increased by 1.5 to 1.9 times and if I say if I say if I say this this is increased by creatinine is increased by 2 to 2.9 times we call it stage 2 and if the serum creatinine is increased by more than 3 times if it is increased by more than 3 times suppose you are having a patient whose, whose serum creatinine is more than 3 times that is what we call we call stage 3 so it's very simple 1 to 1.9 2 to 2.9 more than 3 then simultaneously we need to see the urine output so understand this if i say if i say urine output will be reduced creatinine will increase urine output will decrease that's a logic logical thing kidneys are not working means creatinine will increase nitrogenous waste will increase so patient will not urinate so urine output will decrease so if i say if urine output is decrease and it is less than if it is less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour 0.5 ml per kg per hour from last 6 hours or I can say for 6 hours 
so generally patient with AKI is admitted in ICU so you can see you can see his euro bag in the uh, catheter is inserted so in euro bag you can see patient is having very less urine so it is point, less than 0.5 ml per kg from past 6 hours if I say if I say it is same 0.5 ml per kg per hour but this patient is having the same thing from past 12 hours from past 12 hours so everything is same 0 0.5 0 0.5 if I say in stage 3 what we see it is further reduced less than 0.3 ml per kg per hour and this is happening from last 24 hours so this is the classification that you need to understand see once again kidney disease improvement global outcome so we have two parameters what are these two parameters first is your serum creatinine second is your urine output so creatinine is increased 1 to 1.9, 2 to 2.9, more than 3. 1, 2, 3. Simple. Stage 1, 2, 3. 1, 1 to 1.9, 2 to 2.9, more than 3. If I say urine output, less than 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.3. How I remember this? 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.3. 0 0.5 from past 6 hours, 0 0.5 from past 12 hours, point less than 0 0.3 from past 24 hours. So this is like, based on this, we can categorize or we can stage, make the stage. I understand this one suppose uh, you uh, categorize the patient into stage there are certain markers there are certain markers however we don't use them routinely in practice because these markers are expensive but remember there are some markers in acute kidney injury like like we have markers for uh, MI I told you markers for heart failure I told you similarly we have markers in AKI also so there, we have a uh, four to five there is actually more than 17 20 markers are there so we'll discuss the important one the first important one is angal it is a uh, neutrophilic gelatinous associated lipocalin lipocalin so this is lipocalin this is your first marker after angal remember uh, we can have some other markers like uh, there can be kim1 kim means kidney injury molecule 1 so angal kim1 then we can have markers like interleukin 18 interleukin 18 right then we have a marker called timp2 TIMP is your tissue inhibitor of a metalloprotease 2, TIMP2, right? Then uh, if I say one more, that is your ILGFBP7. So you, don't have, you, can, you can skip it out. Okay, let me remove this, otherwise you will keep on remembering this. So remember, uh, like what I have seen in AIMS exam, they have asked TIMP, TIMP2 and ANGAL. So these are markers that we have in AKI. ANGAL, KIM1, IL18, TIMP2. These are markers, but routinely we don't use this in practice. Clear? Now understand, if I say what will be the phases in AKI, so most of the AKI I told you it is reversible, so in AKI we have certain phases, so which, which are we call phases of AKI, so it is like, uh, I, it's like a one month period where patient will have symptoms on and off, so that is what we call, we call phases, so I can say first phase will be initiating phase or initiation phase. So I can say first will be initiating phase. Second phase, second phase we call this oliguric phase. Oliguric phase. I can say third phase, third phase what we call, we call this diuretic phase. Diuretic phase. And fourth phase, this will be your uh, recovery. So mostly patient will recover but sometime there can be sudden death. Right, there can also be death. So we can have four phases: initiating, oliguric, diuretic, recovery. So understand uh, what is the meaning of initiating phase. Initiating phase means again uh, you will compare two parameters. So you will compare two parameters means you will compare the serum creatinine and you will compare the urine output. Urine output. So just understand, listen to me very carefully. If I say Initiating means initially you will notice uh, this initiating phase. This is this is like from zero to two days. 
0 to 2 days so in this stage what you will notice you will notice initially everything is normal 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 creatinine is normal urine output is normal then I can say a phase that is running from 2 days to 2 weeks 2 days to 2 weeks so here you will notice urine output start reducing and creatinine start increasing so creatinine will increase will start increasing urine output will start decreasing simple then we have a diuretic phase understand this this is running from 2 weeks to 4 weeks right here you will notice serum creatinine will start dropping down it will start means normalizing decreasing trend and your output will start increasing it means your patient is recovering right and ultimately what you will notice again in recovery phase everything will again come back to normal simple everything will again again come back to normal this recovery phase is usually it is seen after four weeks means after a month so what i told you in the beginning it's totally a game of one month right totally a game of one month so if i ask you how patient will present to you so what will be clinical symptoms in aki so there is a wide range of symptom so you can get a symptom because of a many different electrolyte imbalance symptom due, symptom due to increase hydrogenous waste product symptom due to low gfr so if i say the first symptom which i am writing here the patient can compl complain of vomiting the patient can develop vomiting a common finding that we see some patient will have hiccups hiccups so you will give anti-acid no relief you will give uh, sedatives there may be not relief in that case patient is having persistent hiccup right so then we need to give baclofen or some other sedative to control this hiccup why because there's a renogastric reflux because of that patient can develop hiccups vomiting and sometimes you can see chest pain sometimes you can see chest pain later on you will notice patient can have uh, some uh, neurological manifestation we call this uremic encephalopathy uremic encephalopathy so these all symptoms they occur why because of increase in urea blood urea nitrogen is increased so these symptoms will occur if I say second symptom second symptom I can say the patient uh, GFR is reduced because it's a kidney injury so you will notice patient can develop oliguria so because of this patient will develop volume overload there will be hypertension by hypertension there will be oliguria and that oliguria will lead to volume overload and ultimately GFR will be reduced GFR will be reduced so understand this when it is uh, oliguria means water is not being removed from the body the patient can also develop edema so these two symptoms which I told you just now these two symptoms develop because GFR is low GFR is low then understand then because of this toxin accumulating you will see the patient will develop electrolyte imbalance so there can be hyperkalemia there can be hyperkalemia hypercalcemia there can be hyponatremia there can be lot of electrolyte imbalance that we see in a patient so how you will approach so what will be the diagnostic workup in this disease so understand this how we'll approach the so first that we'll recommend is a kft so kft in all patient in kft usually what we see so normally what we see serum creatinine is more right and i can say what is decreased in kft you will see bun is more so if you want uh, you can apply your cockroft gold formula you can calculate the gfr so remember after calculating your egfr so like in ckd lecture i told you different types of method like we use the statin c method epi equation so gfr will be low gfr will reduce if you do if you do the second thing is you can go for electrolyte so electrolyte so there may be some electrolyte imbalance so there can be hyperkalemia so based on those electrolyte what we do we do ecg for example it is hyperkalemia then you will see tall, tall tented t waves so you will also do an ecg patient can have acidosis so that's why what we what else we need we need an abg analysis arterial blood gas arterial blood gas analysis because there is risk of metabolic acidosis whenever there is metabolic acidosis then we should also supplement the patient with soda bicarb clear soda bicarb what else what else we should do understand this uh, if i say uh, last thing which i am writing here that is what we should test is called a fractional excretion of sodium we call this fena we call this fena so fena is a test because now see 
post renal you can easily identify by doing a simple ultrasound but uh, sometimes it is difficulty to differentiate pre renal and renal for that what we need we need fena remember if fena value is less than 1% we call this is because of pre renal cause and if i say fena value is more than 2% more than 2% remember this is more than 2% means this is due to intrinsic or renal intrinsic or renal clear so fena value is important if i say additional test what i can recommend is i told you like usg usg so in usg why we do usg we, you do usg for two reason reason number one is to rule out post renal cause because sometime elderly male they may have some post renal obstruction post renal cause second is in usg you can see kidney size in usg you can see kidney size clear so i'll ask you a question tell me in aki kidney size is increase or decrease or normal so you can see kidney size is normally it is usually normal so kidney size is usually normal remember if kidney size are decrease then that is manifestation of ckd that is not seen in aki so kidney size is normal if you see cortico medullary junction or we call this cortico medullary differentiation this is preserved these two things kidney size will be reduced cortico medullary junction is lost where differentiation is lost in case of ckd so understand this kidney size is normal but uh, if i say exception to this will be will be in infiltrative disease in infiltrative disease for example a patient develop aki because of multiple myeloma because of amyloidosis so exception to this will be here you can notice kidney size will be enlarged so normally what i told you kidney size is normal but an infiltrative disease like multiple myeloma amyloidosis here you will notice kidney size will be enlarged is it clear is it clear kidney size will be enlarged so understand this suppose uh, you are having a patient uh, and he is having oliguria so what we can do is so this is like a test that we can uh, perform so what we should do is uh, we can give a bolus of lasix you can give injection lasix lasix means your furosemide you can give a bolus of lasix that is your furosemide right so after giving lasix right so if we give uh, you can measure the flow rate you can measure urine flow rate flow rate so understand this uh, when we give lasix after lasix after giving lasix we are measuring urine flow rate and still patient is having urine output right less than 200 ml right over 2 hours right so normally what whenever we give furosemide or loop diuretic suppose loop diuretic like what we give we give like uh, 1 mg per kg suppose like in my my weight is 80 kg so you will give me 80 mg so suppose if i give you 1 mg per kg furosemide after this you are measuring the urine flow rate even after giving last 6 you will see your output is less your output is less than 200 ml it means this is this is suggestive of a severe disease it is suggestive of severe disease so normal aki so this is like a good physician what they do they will get an idea like uh, this patient will respond or not respond so what we do is we give a bolus of lasix in 2 hours we'll see the urine output if it is coming like 300 400 ml it means this, this patient will respond but if it is less than 200 ml it means this patient is a sick patient it's having a severe disease and this patient may need dialysis am i clear so usually in aki there is all but remember so this is like a test what we call this we call this uh, 
diuretic provocative test it's a test where you can get a prognostic idea you can get an idea whether your patient will be normally treated in a span of a few days or this patient will be needing dialysis clear am i clear so understand this if i say sometime in urine you will find some cast so you will find you will find find cast in aki you will find granular cast you will find granular cast in aki and this cast is also remember it is also a poor sign so if you find this cast also that is also giving you information that this is a bad type of disease and this again this may need dialysis or it may need transplant sometime it may need transplant so now if i say if i say how you will manage how you are going to treat the patient how you will treat the patient how what are the things so remember treatment treatment in this case treatment of aki will be purely symptomatic so generally what we assume is patient will heal on its own patient will heal on its own so treatment is supportive so how we treat so what the things we will give so if i say let me start with the very basic thing patient is having fluid loss hypovolemia so you will give iv fluid right patient is in sepsis then you will give antibiotics but make sure make sure antibiotics which you are giving this will be in a renal modified dose there are many antibiotic which can cause aki so you should always give in renal modified dose is it clear so generally this is the half dose that we give initial dose bolus we can give full dose but after that we should give half dose so renal modified dose then understand what else we need to correct uh, we need to correct the electrolyte correct electrolyte imbalance so whatever electrolyte is deranged that we need to correct for example hyperkalemia we can give calcium gluconate we can give insulin we can give albuterol we can give salbutamol we can sometimes give pateromer k binders so correct electrolyte imbalance if it is hyponatremia then give iv fluid ns or sometimes we give 3% ns so correct whatever electrolyte imbalance is there then understand patient will develop hypertension which i told you so for that for bp control we can give anti hypertensive drug so either we can we can give labetalol or we can give ccbs like silnedipine so labetalol or calcium blocker we can give if it is metabolic acidosis if patient is having metabolic acidosis then we give soda bicarb so remember soda bicarb is given only when patient is having metabolic acidosis when ph is less than 7.2 otherwise there is no need to give soda bicarbonate ultimately understand this if everything fail patient is not responding then last option will be what last option will be dialysis last option will be dialysis so ultimately last i what i can do i can do is dialysis so if i say in dialysis means what you are doing we you are forcing the kidney to do work so if i ask you dialysis normally it is indicated in ckd right so normally i can say dialysis is indicated in ckd patient am i right so what are other indication of dialysis so when you need dialysis in aki patient that is the question so normally dialysis understand this ckd patient means kidneys are not working at all now what will do there is no hope at all now we have to do dialysis in in aki patient when you do dialysis understand this whenever there is refractory hyperkalemia means you tried everything to correct potassium but there is no potassium is the some is not going out still patient is having potassium values higher suppose this uh, because of aki now patient is having pericarditis we call this uremic pericarditis so there can be ecg changes st elevation there can be pericardial pain there can be pericardial friction rub so in, in that case what we do we do dialysis if i say a patient is developing uremic encephalopathy uremic encephalopathy means he is having altered sensorium patient is in coma stupor state so these are indication so patient is having refractory hyperkalemia patient is having suppose this patient you tried anti hypertensive suppose you tried first you tried clebetalol you tried ccbs you tried even other other all different type of anti hypertensive you tried there is no relief right so sometime what we can try we can try different types of sympatholytic central sympatholytic drug like clonidine 
there is no relief after antihypertensive medication. So, in these are the scenarios, these are the conditions where what we do, we do dialysis in AKI patient. So, understand this question, uremic pericarditis, uremic encephalopathy, these are indication to do dialysis in AKI patient. So, normally dialysis when we do, we do in CKD patient. So, lastly what I can say is just uh, I want to tell you the management is supportive, we need to give the symptomatic treatment. Uh, so, how we will differentiate, suppose a patient came to you with increased serum creatinine, low GFR. So, how you will differentiate that it is your AKI, it's a new patient to you or it is CKD because initial manifestation will be same for both. Now, you will tell me FANA, these are not available in Indian government hospitals, simple, these are not available. So, how you will differentiate to understand this, what is available in our hospital, we try to treat the patient with minimum investigation. So, try to make your diagnosis with minimal possible resources. So, what we can do? The first thing what I can do is, I can check something, I can check for duration. I will take the history. So, if I say duration means, if it is if, if it is a less than 3 month duration, this is generally AKI. If it is more than 3 months, it is generally CKD. So, 3 months is the duration that we should differ, we should understand. But sometimes patient is not giving you adequate history. In that case, what we do, we will go for a simple ultrasound. Ultrasound is available free of cost. In government hospitals, what we can go, we can go for USG. I told you, here you will see a normal size kidney. Like with one exception, that is your infiltrative disease. But here, here you will see, you will see kidney size will decrease. So, there will be shrunken kidney there will be shrunken kidney. Suppose if a patient is giving you prior history of dialysis, means patient is telling you I am having dialysis from past one, one year, two year, I am repeatedly having dialysis every thrice a week. So that is means that you can understand that is the case of CKD now. But it is a new patient like you can see in USG you can see kidney size. So in USG you can see kidney size. Second thing in USG that we should see is corticomedullary differentiation CMD. So, if I say the CMD, I told you corticomedullary differentiation means you can differentiate cortex and medulla. This is well preserved. And this CMD is lost in a patient of CKD. Lost in a patient of CKD. Then if I say, sometimes you will see clinical manifestation, clinical manifestation like I can say uh, metabolic bone disease, MBD. We call this a metabolic bone disease. Or I can say neuropathy. Metabolic bone disease is a new name for osteodystrophy or I can use the term osteodystrophy. We call this renal osteodystrophy. Like in CKD patient you will see brown tumor, you can see osteitis, fibrosa cystica. So this uh, bony manifestation, remember this bony manifestation, you will see they are present in CKD. This bony manifestation in neuropathy, they are usually absent in a patient of AKI. And last thing I can say is when your patient is responding without dialysis, suppose the patient is admitted for 2-3 days and you are not doing anything but patient is automatically improving, is responding. So understand this, if I say patient is responding means prognosis, prognosis in AKI will be good because this is reversible. In CKD prognosis will be bad because CKD remember CKD is always irreversible and fibrosing in nature. You will see always it is it is progressive, irreversible, fibrosing, progressive in nature. Right? So, if I say CKD, you will recommend, uh, you will recommend dialysis through all the patient, but in AKI, dialysis is recommended only in few uh, conditions like refractory hypertension, refractory hyperkalemia, uremic pericarditis or uremic encephalopathy. Otherwise, there is no need to do dialysis. Most of the patient in a span of one month, they will recover. But in CKD, what you have to do, you have to do dialysis. Simple. So this is about your uh, acute kidney injury, a big and decent topic that you should remember. Right? The important thing is nephrotoxin. So, whatever toxins I told that, that should be in your fingertips, then the important is KDGO classification, difference between these two and about these phases. Sometimes they ask question on these phases. So, this is from my side about acute kidney injury. See you with some other videos. Thank you so much. Cut.